very much indeed. And you mentioned the Council of Europe. We've had a couple of questions, actually. Uh, the first is actually from the Council of Europe, who are unable to be here, uh, but they are actually watching us. And uh, this is a question we received from Alexander Seeger from the Council of Europe in Strasbourg in, in France. And he said, at the Council of Europe level, uh, there are a number of uh, adopted guidelines and treaties that show it is indeed possible to square the circle and make security, privacy, and openness not only compatible, but mutually reinforcing goals. These include the Convention on Cybercrime as a global guideline, human rights guidelines for ISPs, openness benchmarks with regard to the public value of the Internet, freedom of expression and Internet filters, as well as regarding the protection of the security, privacy, and dignity of children on the Internet. They, these may also be useful, uh, he says, for societies outside Europe. And a related comment or question from another remote participant asks if the ITU cybersecurity agenda and its model kit on cybercrime will be a competing or supplemental instrument to the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention. And they'd like to know what do IGF participants think of both the convention and the ITU's cybersecurity agenda. Gender. Your comments. Uh, where are we going to go next? Let's go there. Yes, lady in the. Uh, just there. Yeah. We'll get you a microphone. Yes, you. <laughs> and then we'll go to the gentleman in front of you who's just passed you the microphone. Yeah, can, uh, can be heard. Okay. I'm Nenita Tanchia from the group uh, Theresian Association. We are involved in the field of education and culture. So I would like to make a remark about. Um, what was uh, asked a while ago about education. Um, education for the internet or for that matter, any other objective, I would put in the context of uh, education as a whole, which means that um, uh, today, I think the world is in need of quality education. And we can even uh, see that in the actual internet. If you see, for example, the number of websites dedicated to, uh, let's suppose, interactive, reflective um, uh, websites, I, ca I can say that very few are, are available. And also that even in terms of networking, social networking even precedes or it's even higher. There are more people going to social networking rather than to uh, network networking for reflection, having common ideas, putting ideas together. So I think there's a, the, there's a crisis there. And I would say that education for internet will not be just a punctual thing of education for internet, but rather I question education today. Because education today is just like a stepping stone towards economic liberation or economic stability, but it is not real education in the sense of um, uh, giving gi or equipping the person to develop the potential to the full, uh, making use of his or her talents for integral development and for formation of society. That, that is what I call education. And that is important uh, for us to know that education today is beyond the classrooms. So all of us who are gathered here, adults, we are, all have this responsibility of educating in the family, in the workplace, even here among us, and education also has this important aspect of witness, of testimony. So even how much you tell a person, a small child, but if you yourself doesn't live up to the ideals, then it's of no use. Yeah? And therefore, to me, it not be taken out of context. To me, it's quality education right now, and even in our schools, everywhere we are. All right, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, if you could just give the gentleman a microphone after that gentleman here. But yes, you first. Thank you, Jonathan. My name is uh, Pawan Dugal from Cyberlaw, and uh, for all the Web, <laughs> web 2.0 users, for history, I would like my thoughts to record it as Bob and Dugo. <laughs> and so the question is, is it this microphone's fault for not checking to see whether I was Bob and Dugo, or is it IGF's fault for allowing me to represent myself as Bob and Dugo, or is it the translator's fault? I mean, there are so many levels on which it is, A, it is me committing the identity theft, However, there are a number of pathways or footpaths on which this burglar entered the house, and we wonder how many of those people we can hold responsible for my action. <coughs> so I, I'm glad you indulged me with that. <laughs> I saw someone looking at me crazy. Um, my, my point, uh, uh, yeah. reflecting on the European Council's message that you just read to us about the ability for openness, security, and privacy to all coexist without necessarily having trade-offs, I think that's something that's definitely possible. 
In fact, we heard earlier today, I think it was in the first session, where uh, the comment was made that although privacy is a lot more cultural and, can, and needs to be uh, respected on more of a local level, security can be a lot more objective and can exist with a certain set of common ideals and principles that could be, uh, and then the word introduced by Joe Oladef was interoperable. So if there are some regular standard that everyone can agree to that are more subject, that are more not subjective, that are more objective, and then the privacy aspect is come in with some more cultural context, then it's very possible within a framework of interoperability to have all these goals be met without necessarily doing a trade-off. One might say, you know, pro, uh, prolonging the analogy before, is would then IGF be responsible for checking the frequency of my modulation of my voice or my DNA and figuring out whether I was following, and then therefore, did they violate my privacy in doing so? Do I have the right to be anonymous or to pose as someone else, or do I not have that right? And so it's a sticky question, obviously, which is why it's not going to be solved today or in, in the near future. But 